We pick up right where we left off um, during uh, season one. There's no escape for Georgina. Um, she now she is confronted with uh, the dilemma of how to get away with murder, uh, not only practically but also her in terms of her own conscience. Um, she returns to the Villa Carmela and is living with the Cleos family and watching them uh, become more and more concerned about the disappearance of Adam and then her stepson, who her, she's her stepson, who murdered she has murdered. So, one, yeah. uh, so it, and and we introduce a, a, a new family. Um, so the you you sense that the um, the grapevine is very thick in the south of France and and within that society. Uh, it's very hard to keep secrets, so it's going to be tricky for, for her. Mm, it, it's a world of contrast, isn't it? Because we've got these, this beautiful scenery, this incredible coastline of the Côte d'Azur, and then this very dark world into which Georgina is being dragged further and further, and this evolution of her, the, the moral decline, I suppose, we're seeing. So where does that head in series two? Um, she, uh, yeah, she, she's now become... She, she, was, she was sort of this guileless, innocent, optimistic girl who now had all this tragedy heaped on her. And because of her actions at the end of season one, um, she has to just put one foot in front of the other. And, and she's determined to prove to herself that she's not a sociopath, but also uh, maintain her power and position. And so she is quite corrupted by the world that she lives in. What stands out about Riviera is that it's the women who are driving this show. Is that, was that part of the appeal for you when you saw the script? It, it was. I mean, I, I couldn't have anticipated exactly how much this was going to be about the women of the Riviera, but I, um, I'm so proud to be part of a show that, something that, something, a show like this could so easily be about the billionaire men and the, the, the male businessmen. Um, and certainly we have our girls in bikinis and we have all the, the glitz and the glamour, but, and women who are rivals with each other, but, um, but really the, the powerhouses and, the, and, and the, the movers and shakers are the female characters. Um, Do you see that as a trend uh, more and more in TV now? We've got shows like Killing Eve, Fleabag, Big Little Lies, The Handmaid's Tale, all big female-led narratives. I, 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 it, I'm, it's exciting. I, right now, as an actress, I'm more excited about the opportunities coming my way and also for my peers. Um, I do think that, that there are some amazing uh, female-driven shows on TV. Um, we're joined this season by Juliet Stevenson, mm -hmm. who is an amazing actress. Yeah. And, um, and so, so you have Juliet Stevenson, Lena Olin, me, um, and and other women in the show, but uh, I remember looking at them one day on set, and I was like, "Oh, the women of the Riviera!" And it's not, it's not just we're not just um, you know arm candy or, or trophies. These are all women who are. These stories are about the women. The, the, these women are um, are forces to be reckoned with. Um, you talked about the the roles that are coming your way for, for TV. What about movies? Is Hollywood slow to catch up with that when we're talking about these strong female female led narratives? Um, I, I I don't think so. No, I'm I think um, I mean, and when you say Hollywood, I don't think there's really much of the the, the line between film and television is quite blurred now mm. because um, so much of us watch both at home. Um, and the quality of television is really um, on par with film, I think. Mm -hmm. um, when you uh, look at what you've done over your career, we're talking about the role of Georgina. Um, you've played a lot of tough female characters, very strong female characters. Are you conscious of the kind of message that you want to portray through those roles? Um, yes, I, uh, yes. Uh, um but I, I'm often at a loss when I'm asked to describe Georgina, the, the, mm -hmm. the character I play in Riviera, because she's so complicated. Um, so it's only, it's only really in hindsight that I can say um, how, how strong she is or how much of a backbone she has. And I, and I do appreciate um, showing her vulnerability and, and, and her flaws, because I don't think anyone's interested in, I'm not interested in watching uh, a story about 
perfect people who make the right decisions all the time. One of uh, your defining roles, and I suppose a defining role in film for a generation, was that of Cat in 10 Things I Hate About You, 20 years old this year. And, and that was a film that broke the, the 90s rom-com mould in a way, didn't it? In the way in which it portrayed this teenage girl. She didn't have to change the way she was to attract the guy. Mm -hmm. And it's still relevant today. Well, and her goal wasn't to attract the guy, which mm -hmm. I thought was uh, an, uh, interesting and new. Um, I wanted that part so badly because it was the first time that I had read uh, a character of a teenage girl with who is so feisty and um, uh, contrarian. Yeah, uh, um, and uh, and anti that the film, the narrative of the film, the anti misogynist message that it has about it, and yet based loosely on the Taming of the Shrew, which is Shrew, which is very misogynistic mm -hmm. text. It is. It was written by uh, ten, ten Things I Hate About You was written by two female screenwriters, and um, I think. One of the reasons uh, that it that it, it grabbed audiences um, is because it had a bite to it, mm -hmm. in, in a way that rom coms sometimes don't. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm just, it's it's a wonderful to be a part of a movie that people are still thinking about 20 years later. Mm -hmm. And of course, the Bourne movies as well, marking your shift from the, the teen roles into um, this huge franchise. Mm -hmm. Again, something that I couldn't have anticipated. I remember sitting, I was in university and I was sitting in my dorm room, my agents had sent me um, just the, like the, the, the couple of scenes that I would have, that I would have been auditioning for in uh, the very first Bourne movie. Because your character was originally killed off. She was and we weren't allowed to see the entire script, it was very secretive. Um, I, I thought it was just going to be a, the one-off thing mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and m luckily my character, they recut it so my character survived but I didn't know that it was going to be, you know, many, many years later that we'd be making more. Yeah, and what is coming up next for you? Hustlers? Yes, what I'm, you tell us? I'm really excited about it. Um, we just finished, but it's going to be coming out soon. Um, it's a movie called Hustlers, and it's based on a New York Magazine article, a true story of these strippers at a club in New York City who, when the stock market crashed, they weren't bringing in as much money, and they decided to start drugging the men that would come in to the champagne room and, and they ended up uh, running up hundreds of thousands of dollars in their credit card tabs up to the point where they were making millions. Um, they didn't get caught for the longest time because the men didn't want to come forward and, or couldn't remember what happened and then eventually they were caught. But I play um, the New York Magazine journalist who covers the story and interviews these women um, and slowly starts to look at them as entrepreneurs, dare I say. Fantastic, and that's alongside JLo, uh, Cardi B, and you say that's coming out soon. Um, away from movies, you've described yourself as being obsessed with keeping up with the news. You're very politically engaged. You've been vocal about Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. Approval ratings for him at their highest since he came into office mm. right now. Uh, looking ahead to 2020, do you think he's going to get a second term? I mean, if I could predict that, I... Um I have no idea, and I had no I, I had an inkling that he was going to win the last time around, um, and I, I'm really at a loss for something to say because um, it's a look of despair. It is. It is. I mean, I, I, I would like to. Th I would like to be optimistic, and I would like to think that um, there's hope for my country and and how it affects the rest of the world. But um, I'm not alone in that country, so. No, I mean, I mean, you look at what's going on in U.S. politics, and you look at the Mueller investigation, and mm -hmm. talk of Russian collusion, and the, the, the Twitter rows that are going on. I mean, it could be a Hollywood screenplay at the moment, couldn't it? Um, I, I look forward to the day when it becomes a movie, and we can look back on this fleeting time mm. in U.S. history. I mean, I hope that I hope that it is fleeting. I don't know. I can't. I don't have a crystal ball, so. OK, fantastic. <laughs> uh, Julia Stiles, thank you very much indeed for joining us. And uh, Series 2 of Riviera out on May the 23rd. Thank you. Thank you.